Photosynthesis. The power to make food from the light of the sun. Filling our world with delicious oxygen. <sighs> Hello the 31st here, how's it going? Today we are wading into the realm of speculative evolution and investigating the mysterious origins of grass type Pokemon. Hashtag Team Grass, minus 2 and 5. So I've seen this misconception floating around that grass type Pokemon are simply plants that have been brought to life by some mysterious magic. But those people are idiots. No, Pokemon are their own kingdom on the tree of life, separate from plants and animals, but obviously much more similar to animals in every way, especially their cells. So why are these animal-like organisms so plant-like? And crucially, how are they capable of photosynthesis? Well, what is photosynthesis? It's this. But this is chemistry, and chemistry is boring. What it actually looks like is this, but this is complicated and probably just as boring. All we need to know right now is that plant cells have these organelles called chloroplasts, which contain the photosynthetic pigment chlorophyll. Chloroplasts are basically the cellular machinery that carries out photosynthesis, and their presence in vast quantities is what makes plants look green. But that stuff is all basic, like, primary school level stuff that we should all know. So the question now is, if only plants have chloroplasts, how do Pokemon photosynthesize? Well, the answer is that I lied to you. All of this was just so that I could talk to you about one of my new favourite animals. May I present the Eastern Emerald Elysia? It's a sea slug. This gem is one of a very few photosynthetic animals. These sap-sucking emerald entities have a subcellular endosymbiotic relationship with the chloroplasts of green algae that they eat. This phenomenon is called kleptoplasty, aka stealing plastids. The cells of Elysia's digestive tract engulf the chloroplasts whole and intact via the process of phagocytosis, similar to how your white blood cells engulf foreign entities. Even more impressive, they can keep the chloroplasts alive and active for months. And this requires proteins not coded for by the chloroplasts' own DNA. Normally around 90% of them are coded for and produced by the algae. Research has showed us that the sea slugs have actually obtained and incorporated some of these genes into their own genome, probably by a horizontal gene transfer with the algae. And this allows for chloroplast repair and function. While the chloroplasts aren't a permanent part of the sea slug, these genes are and they have even been identified in their sex cells, meaning they are passed on to their offspring. So, speculative evolution. How do we get from here to here? Well actually it's pretty simple to explain, it's a process that's happened many times before. During these endosymbiotic relationships, eventually through the magic of luck and natural selection, the organelles find a way to replicate when the cell does, and to get passed down. The two most famous examples of this are of course the notorious powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, and chloroplasts themselves, the other powerhouse. Those things I've been talking about for the past however many minutes. As the theory goes, one day a very long time ago, mitochondria and chloroplasts were both independent, free-living microorganisms, and they got eaten by another cell. But instead of being digested, they remained intact, and they just sort of stayed there and began their relationship. As powerhouses, they provide free food to the cell in return for its protection. And the rest is history. A long, complicated, genetic -y history. And this is why mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own genomes. But all this happened in the days of unicellular life, where things were just much easier. For one, taxes didn't exist. But the fact that Elysia is on that path, and one day might be able to replicate the chloroplasts that it eats, so it doesn't need to anymore, 
and might even one day be able to pass them on, shows us that in the development of early Pokemon life, an event like this could definitely be the starting point for grass type Pokemon. So basically what I'm saying is long ago, probably in a prehistoric ocean, well before the time of Lilip and Cradilly, an early Pokemon or proto Pokemon life form was chilling and eating algae when it absorbed its chloroplasts into its cells. And over a very long time, they eventually became one with it. And this event gave rise to the ancestors of the Pokemon, which would later become the best starters. Over eons, these ancestors diversified based on habitat, food sources, and other selective pressures, leafing the ocean and joining the plants on land. Until one day, they had become the many species we know today. It's also possible that this event happened multiple times throughout evolutionary history. As a strategy, it's pretty great. You get free energy from the sun for doing nothing, while also eating and respiring, which means you get a ton of extra energy you can use for other things. Plus, just like Elysia being bright green and looking like a plant, it provides great camouflage. And if sea slugs aren't a complex enough animal for you to buy this theory, there is a vertebrate that can do this as well. The spotted salamander uses photosynthesis to provide oxygen to its eggs, but it's nowhere near as pretty, so I don't care. In my Pokedex BS video, I said animal cells with chloroplasts was probably how Leafeon worked, and it looks like I'm probably right. Um, yeah, uh, Pokemon theory on the origins of grass type Pokemon, slash, excuse to gush over a slug, but damn, it is a beautiful slug. For more Pokemon biology theories, look, here if you enjoyed please subscribe like and comment your thoughts down below what did you think tell me um new recording environment because i've moved house pretty echoey see how it goes all right bye oh that was a meaty clap